pretty good. Okay, good. Yeah, we see. So. Yeah, good. Okay. All right. So uh, I want to welcome all of our viewers to the third installment of our Movement Matters discussion series um, of Symposia. And uh, the second one that's actually happened since Bill Ayers and the Body Politic panel got rescheduled. Um, so stay tuned for information on that. Uh, we're here today uh, for uh, Invisibilia, which uh, uh, is a discussion about the dematerialization history in dance and performance uh, and in art. Uh, and well, Shanahan was going to join us today, but she's sick, so we'll try and get her on a future one. But what I have here with me today, uh, Sabine Ott, Katie Waddell, uh, Jan Bartosek, and Petra Bachmeier, uh, all who are bringing certain perspectives on this topic uh, from a, a array of different fields. Uh, to set this up a little bit, uh, one of the major frameworks that we set out in the discussion was the uh, current role of immateri immateriality. Uh, it's lost grounds in things like professionalization, it's advances, and persistent social currencies. So I want to set up the conversation a little bit person by person here by discussing each uh, individual artist's practice. And I thought, you know, Petra, I would start with you because your work is one of the most immaterial of all the forms here represented, uh, really talking about light, right? It's, it's, it, it's, it is material and not material. Um, and I thought I would start by sort of addressing that and the history of light art and how you came to it um, and how it evolved for you as a practice a little bit. I actually came with, to light art through performance art. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> really? I didn't even know that. Yeah, it's very appropriate to be part of this panel, I guess. That's hilarious. And I have actually been very interested in, in an art form that is beyond the object that lives in the experience of the art. And that's how I actually got into performance art. I used to be a performance artist myself, okay. creating scenarios. I'm sure a lot of our viewers situations. wouldn't know that. Yeah. And um, I introduced using media, like new media, analog, digital, and over time removed myself together and collaborating with my partner, Jean Valero. Right. And over time we removed ourselves entirely and left it to the space and what happens with space and light. And for us, the audience is the performer. They're interacting with the work. The artwork would not be the same without a viewer. Right. And so the viewer becomes the participant mm -hmm. for us. And that can be a gallery situation. It can also be a public art situation where the public interacts or feels like they're interacting. So it's more like creating a platform for other people to be engaging with rather than us activating that space. Right. So the work, the light, the video, we do work with material. We actually use ob objects to bounce light off, to interact with light. It's always about the interaction with light. So that creates the scenario, the, the environment. And I think. Yeah, the environment that's. It just occurred to me that uh, listening to you talking about it, that that was such a <laughs> central tenet of the work. Is, is that when you were doing performance? than definitive of the work you were making at the time, the environment. So that's, cause that's a very interesting uh, shift that took place in dance as well. Yeah, I mean, it was either like us establishing very clearly what the space should be, like those different settings, or also responding to a site. Like, uh, actually, I studied on Hamburg and I did quite a few of site interventions where I created mm -hmm. like almost like happenings, like very much like influenced yeah. by the 60s of like, oh, here I am, this is what I do, you can come and be there or not be there. So. Right. So were you studying the history of happenings and like Alan Capra's work? And yeah, I did. I actually also studied with Henning Christiansen, who used to be a composer of Joseph Beuys. So it was really kind of like a fluxus idea of like, oh, people taking a Hoover and creating a scenario with Hoovers. Or oh. Uh, my professor used to create music with birds flying around him, so that was kind of like creating the by chance composition. So that was kind of like the idea that I was driven by, like, oh, how can you create a scenario without the pure experience, like creating an experience rather than, I mean, we are talking about artifacts too, artifacts are important, I was the experience with yeah. 
find its way in the history of art. So how did you, I'm just, I'm just really curious, like, what was the initial moment where you thought, oh, you discovered like it was just sort of part of your vocabulary and you thought this was... I love how um, immaterial it is, yeah. but it is everywhere. So it influences how I see things mm -hmm. and from light to dark, there's so many, so many experience levels to have in light and space. So it's really, I mean, we actually over time we become more and more object based. We're right. getting more and more interested in the actual, like, oh, how do you actually capture an experience and make it into something that you can have? Right. <laughs> <laughs> an object. So we're coming from like complete like experiential way and like realm into a real object. Experience. Right. That's been so. I think Mitten. For many people, it's sort of opposite of how you <laughs> would get into it. But, uh, but uh, so, Jen, you ended up working with Petra on a production last year, which is sort of how I initially discovered um, Hedwig. Um, there was a sculptural element within the dance performance. Um, how did that collaboration come about? Well, actually, that was our third collaboration. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. uh, we began collaborating almost ten, eight, ten years ago um, for. Uh, a work I did, um, I suppose it was some sort of ancestral uh, uh, query, um, but Petra created an amazing image at the very end, where we pulled these veils down across the, uh, the um, dancers' faces and projected uh, uh, bodies of other people on, onto them. And completely transformed them. It was like this wonderful, amazing surprise that transformed uh, the moment. So that was our first piece that we did. Um, uh, called Earth. It was Earthly Tongues. Uh, second was um, Dance of Forgotten Steps. Also sort of probing. Um, the ephemerality of. of the moment. Um, so Petra created white, these white shadows from the dancers. We, um, the dancers' movement then were projected onto the screens that were created by Barbara Cooper, who's a sculptor. Okay. Um, and uh, light figured, I think, very um, strongly into that work. And then the last piece. Um, it's called the Sand Dance, and I think that's the piece you're referring right. to. Mm -hmm. um, also, the, the sculpture was by Barbara Cooper, um, and it was folded paper sculptures that have hills and valleys, basically large-scale origami pieces. Um, and uh, because they have hills and valleys, the light kind of, right. it, 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 it sort of, I don't know. It beautiful. creates a spectral depth. If there's a depth to yeah. the light, and the light kind of shimmers, and in, in it's almost like it pulses, yeah. and almost feels alive. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, as if you know, as if you're watching a tree or something. It's you know, uh, something living. Um, so anyway, uh, that's the work that we've done together. Was well, it sort of a natural resonance in terms of thinking about the environment between the two different approaches that drew to each other to collaborate? Was that something you were thinking about at the time, or was this sort of like, oh, there's a new projection technology that could be incorporated into our scene building? How did you sort of approach it initially? Well, Petra and Sean had an exhibit at the Cultural Center, okay. which is how I first met them. And uh, we were, Hedwig Dances was in residence at the Chicago Cultural Center for 20 years, so I, I, I saw the work, I was engaged and interested by it. Um, I like working with other artists collaborating because I find that it stretches the ideas, the, the you know collaboration, the discussion helps take uh, you know what you're doing into d new realms. Um, and so you know it's taken us I guess different places, but some of them are similar. I think. Um, I mean, there's a beautiful language between like dance. And the poetry of light, mm. you know, there is this kind of fleeting, ephemeral nature to both practices, really. And once they combine, and once it actually works, it's kind of like watching magic happen in front of you. <laughs> yeah, this is sort of like talking about environments. So light art is uh, some of the earliest Greek ideas about it. You know, is uh, part of the architecture. 
right? It's, it's sort of built, mm -hmm. built environment to begin and, with. And in dance, it often happens, you know, right at the end. I mean, we, of course, we experimented with it in Barbara's basement or whatever, but really, we don't see it until right with, right before the production goes up, and then it's like over in a weekend, right. usually. Um, so that in itself is very, very fleeting. Right. I mean, almost you don't know what the work is until you see it. You don't really know what the work is until you see it on the stage in its full right. uh, realization. Yeah. And in some ways, uh, <laughs> so every time, almost every time I do something, there are changes in the next iteration. I mean, just, you know. Right, just no dance is ever the same. Same, right. right. Yeah, absolutely. No, uh, speaking of the sort of collaborative side of this, Katie, I was drawn to bring you on to this discussion because of the, the festival in Period, which you know, there's, there's, there's tiers of, of what I want to talk about with that, but um, yours is sort of a uh, second floor rear is really a sort of collaborative festival right. uh, where people are working together. There's not like a corporate infrastructure behind everything. This is artists making an event together. I mean, it's almost. Um I mean, it's almost. It's, I would say it's almost like less collaborative than it is like. So all the all the events that are part of the festival are artist run. So, um, I and like a group of curators, we like do the initial like sending out the call and like maybe we invite a few people and we look at all the proposals and we kind of decide like who's in and who's out. Um, but from there, we're really hands off. So it's it's like they get to make all the creative all the artists get to make all the creative decisions. Um, they run the thing. And so it's um, it's collaborative in that it's like just a lot of different people, like doing the doing their work and you know and doing it at the same time like according to a schedule that I kind of like put together, um, and yeah, does that answer your question? In a way, it's, it's sort of social organizing, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which I think you know, is a viable artist practice mm -hmm. these days, you know, and. and <laughs> But, but a lot of the work you're selecting is very specifically participatory. Yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I mean I've mean, i always been drawn to participatory art um, for a long time. And uh, something I only realized recently is like a lot of the backstory behind Second Floor Rear is that I um, okay. am from North Carolina, where there's not like a big art market. Like you have like a couple state museums that are like what you would expect. And there's like pottery, you know, right. like, like a lot of like crafts. And so, like, I felt like I never really got to see, like, any of, like, the good avant-garde art. Um, but as I was, like, kind of, like, ending my undergraduate degree, um, some social practice artists actually started coming into the area and started establishing. And um, I was kind of seeing for the first time, like, what good art could be when it's not tethered to, like, a gallery system. And all of that work is, like, participatory. And I was also involved with like Elsewhere Collaborative, which is like this artist residency that's in what used to be a thrift store. So all the, art, the artists who come in there, they don't like make paintings or whatever. They make installations, et cetera. They make their work out of the work that was a part of the thrift store. And like nothing ever leaves, nothing cool. ever goes out. So it's just constantly evolving. And um, as an intern, I, I was an intern there. As an intern, I, like I lived there. And the artists live there like in the, with all the stuff. And so, um, I think that actually really informed, like I remember coming here for graduate school and somebody asked me what I wanted to study and I was like, well, I want to know if, um, if like where the work gets shown, if that influences like what kind of work is made. Because um, right. I was thinking about museums and like, are we like making work for museums? Or like what, if you just make it for your house, how's that different? I mean, the, the historical avant-garde reaction mm -hmm. was to reject the museum as yeah. a place where art dies absent its social context, mm -hmm. right? So there's sort of definitely right. a historical precedent for that. And I think kind of my point of view is that like, well, the museum is one kind of social context. Um, it's just like a social context that like has a lot of support already. And there are other artists out there making work that's really interesting work that are self-organizing. Um, and that is kind of like what the festival is for, to celebrate the work that's like, the, the work that's like kind of self-organized. Um, and it's kind of like sprung up in response to like there not being enough infrastructure for artists. Right. So. Yeah, I think that there's an interesting sort of disjuncture there. We're, we're talking about the history and how this the ideas of participation have evolved, and mm -hmm. really, this is you know one of the precedents we were set up, sort of setting out on with this panel discussion was uh, Lucy Lippard's uh, Seven Years in the Art World, talking about uh, the history of the moment of, where dematerialization became a yeah. sort of important thing. And, no, I, I, I was reading uh, Claire Bushwick's 
Bishop's book recently, and she pointed out that that Lippert had lifted that from uh, a figure named Oscar Masada uh, from the Rosario group, um, who began talking about that history. And I, I, that was a sort of leftist liberal idea of trying to create greater quality in the world. And I think we talk about dematerialization, we're talking about uh, the value of objecthood over you know, what art is doing to sort of engage the public or not, and this is something we talked about, but Sabina, I, I, this sort of brings me to you a little bit because your work, while it's collaborative, you also are very um, out there and engaged in sort of activist uh, activity. You're, I've seen you sort of doing this sort of Black Lives Matter protests, and you know, you're, you're, you're active and engaged with the, these sort of social issues in a way that, um, that necessarily other artists would be. I was curious about how you would sort of think about that. But actually, yeah, this is really nice bouncing around here. I was, I was, um, I, I've always been really interested in setting, to, separating my work into two or three different sections, really. Okay. And that I make things, and on one hand, I'm very much involved in making sculpture and painting, and I love being in the studio and doing that one-on-one -on -one thing. But I also make spaces, and when I was in graduate school, after taking actually having a lecture from Bill Irwin, um, telling us in his, one of his first iterations that, um, you know, see, here's a square. He like put this on the blackboard at the, where I went to school, and then he erased it, and he said, this is art without the square. So I mean, <laughs> it's like I grew up in that, and so for me to make objects and right. paintings was being oppositionally defiant to the zeitgeist of my generation. Right. Huh. But um, I also really, separate out and make spaces for other people to make works. And so I, you know, by having this space called Terrain Exhibitions, which is repurposing private space and making a public space in order to see work and letting artists do what they will. And big, a big part situation. of the Chicago tradition too. Yeah. yeah, no, it is a big part of the Chicago tradition, but I had an alternative space in San Francisco when I was still a graduate right. student. So right. it's a habit. Right. But I separate it from my studio practice a lot. And I separate that from my um, protest work. Right. Okay. I, I don't consider that my art practice. So I they're really, categorized. I, yeah. They are categorized because I think I. Yes, they are. I see. I, I see them as sort of informing each other. In a sense. Of course they are. Yeah. It's the same person doing them, but yeah. but at the same time, I, I've always. Um, sort of found it really annoying when artists would say, <laughs> I'm going to show your work and that's going to be my work. And it's like, no, 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 no. There's separate things that, that happen and, and we're all multivalent and we can do many different course, kinds of things. So right, yeah. I don't want to, yeah. I don't you don't want to be reductive about it. No, yeah. I don't. And I, because I think yet everything has a different nodality and a different tone and a different purpose. Right. And I don't want to smash them together. But, so the, but the collaborative side is definitely a matter of it is, working and, with these other artists. But it was also, it's working with the other artists and it's working with people in my studio and it's also working and teaching. So to me, those things actually yeah. are much more engaged in a kind of um, collaborative practice that is informed by a, a Fluxus history, mm. you know. Do you see a social organizing in, the, in that it, sense? Yeah, okay. I do. I, I see it as, you know, um, like Capra making a space saying, okay, everybody, here's some black paint, paint a string and run around with it. Right. I mean, yeah. basically, that's, that's what you're doing. And it all goes under the belief, right, that art should be in everyday life and produced as everyday life, which I could argue about that not being so interesting right now. Sure, right. I think it's sort of reached a point where that is such a fluid thing that's out there and people just sort of accept it as the norm that it's not about challenging convention anymore. Right? No, it's not. We were having this conversation earlier about social practice, for instance. Yeah. Becoming, and this is part of the conversation here, is the professionalization of certain of these types of historical avant-garde practices to the point where they're, um, they're part of the current values that are out there. And, uh, and they've been sort of been sort of uh, absorbed into how the, the, the industry that it has become art with the sort of globalization of finance and this kind of things approaches um, that, that work. They've sort of co-opted it. You know, this conversation about neoliberalism taking over the avant-garde and I always think of uh, Chicago as sort of an enclave outside of the coast where the avant-garde got to have a little more leeway. <laughs> didn't get as quite as, as, as absorbed. So this conversation gets have some different currency here that it might have in New York or it might have in LA. Um, but uh, you know, I think the sort of connection between all of your work is, 
in a sense for me, and sort of open this up now to a larger conversation, is I, I think that we're talking about work that you make that's not just what you see in front of you. There's always something else happening behind the object, the dancer, the light itself. The, there's a thinking that's going on. And I, I, I sort of want to open the, the conversation to that, that notion a little bit and how much you think about that in your, in your work, in your practice. This whole, this whole conversation too, I, just to good, say this about the word practice, that you know, Sheldahl sell, it says that that's a sort of professionalization term, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's about you know, we're called to make the work. So how you to use that sort of you know as a term of art, how you perceive it as um, how you perceive the work is sort of informed by thinking that's that's the thing or not. Just something about that term practice. Yeah. There's a new art gallery in Oak Park opened up called Practice. Oh, I hadn't heard of it. See, there you go. It's all worked <laughs> in. It's all subsumed into, and it's a house yeah. gallery. And it's, you know, I'm just being. You know, I, had, I was having this conversation not too long ago uh, with an artist friend of mine who's a cartoonist. And he said, you know, when you hang out with a bunch of cartoonists, they sit around and talk about how to draw well. When you hang out with a bunch of uh, visual art people, they're strategizing how to get a gallery show or strategizing. Mm -hmm. So there's just like a difference now in terms of what people see as career paths and what people see as, you know, and I think, tend to think of dance as sort of, I think a lot of people sort of go, oh, dance is like the least valued among the arts in a sense, right? People don't know how to value it. Um, and it, you know, for me, it's like poetry. Uh, there's a sort of, you go into it not because there's a status to achieve, but because you care about the ideas, you care about the work. And so there's these different incentives in it, right? And so how do you think about it? There's yeah. someone who's okay, so dance, sort of at the top of your game now, right? As it were, within that field. Um, I've been doing it a long time, yeah. I don't know if that's top of the game, but um, yeah. uh, I mean, I think a lot of it happens for me in the studio working with the dancers, and some of the most interesting things are, and also frustrating, are trying to sort of play with the ideas and see, you know, see where they go, how they developed. How they develop within, you know, a certain group of people within the room. Um, I also think that it's very interesting to see the difference between what happens in a studio mm -hmm. and also what happens on the stage. Um, when the dancers are dancing among themselves, and when the dancers are dancing with an audience. Um, yeah, the poet doesn't have to be there reading his poem, but the dancer definitely has to be there. Dancing again. Yeah. I have a very vivid memory. The first time I actually witnessed Jen's rehearsal room, I felt like sculpture in the making. Right. And I really, really liked your slow process of how every movement follows the next one and how it's really sculpted very carefully and very slowly, how you kind of give directions and actually spark ideas. And how the movement falls into place in a way. It's been really kind of informative and actually the studio, like watching a rehearsal is completely different than watching a, a finished performance on stage. Like it seemed like two worlds. Like, they each have their own language and of course the, stu the studio needs the stage as a, as a end product but there's so much within that studio practice that is already so um, incredibly interesting. I, I mean, I find the, uh, mm. almost the most pleasure actually when things start coming, to, when the ideas start sparking, mm. coming together, and then also the exchange that happens with the other collaborators, such as Petra. And um, but yeah, but it is slow. Right. I mean, for me, it's slow anyway, I, because. I feel like I'm building something. I, I tend to think that division, you're, you're bringing up a division between uh, this, the visuality of the movement, the sort of sculptural element of it. And I tend to think in, in dance, you know, there's this sort of division um, between that perspectival plane of dancers moving in space and the choreography, which is this way. It's, 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 it's a, it's a, it moves to a sort of um, different perspective. And 
so the, the choreo is this something where you choreograph heavily? And are, you, are you looking at it from the dancers or are you looking at it from sort of sitting there thinking about movement that you want to see happen? Oh, can you just repeat that? Yeah, so the, 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 sort of, the sort of shift that there's two different approaches, right? That watching the dancers move and just the discovery that happens just through the movement on its own or sitting down and sort of writing choreography. It, it's, it, it comes from the interaction of the dancers right, okay. from a given direction in general. That's the way I work. Okay. And I would like to see what happens between two individuals, the dancer and the dance, so to speak. Right. The dancers interacting with each other, given some you know, instruction, right. open instruction, and then playing with what's, what's sparking in that moment and then building from that. Okay. So, I mean, I, I think that at the beginning of my career, I was coming in more with structure right away. Now the structure comes from what happens. So you're really putting yourself in an audience mode right away, seeing how they interact and thinking about it that way. Uh, yeah, or, or seeing some, how they interact and wondering, well, what can I do with this? You know, how, how, how can this go? So it, it sometimes leads to more questions than to like uh, decision at the a decision at the okay. moment. Yeah. It, it seems so that, I mean, if we're talking about early performance art and early dance, the goal of both of those was to do the Brechtian thing of breaking the fourth wall so that there was no theatrical performance. There was no choreographed movement. There was, um, that was taken apart or, in performance art, often the, the sculptural object was the body, and the body proceeded to do a series of things that were not choreographed right. but durational, and so the body replaced the object. The, uh, the body was the object. Right. Or the piles of meat and the body. Right, the piles of meat and, yeah. and yeah. the body. But, yeah. but the kind of dance, yeah. I mean, you, you're talking about re-theatricalizing also. Um, mostly, yes. mostly, and and also through light as well, which is a highly theatrical kind of performance. So it's it's kind of got a little bit full circle from the impulse to use the body to displace or dematerialize the object, or use the body to become right. a, a, a series of uh, everyday moves. Right. Right. So yes. So you know, and, and sort of getting to the, the structural approaches, it's, I, my curiosity is about oh. So what, it, what informs that for you? Is it about, I mean, you were talking about audience interaction, talking about dematerialization. You know, there were sort of maybe some sort of social perspectives and norms and values and that would inform people's decision to use one type of approach or another. And that, that I think, is sort of the background of this is like, our social uh, skies have changed over the years, you know, since um, maybe when Judson was happening and they were sort of pushing all these conventions out the window and, and art was happening doing the same thing. They were sort of, so they were really informing each other in an immediate sense, you know, uh, performance artists and dancers working in the same context. And then since then there have been these sort of woof and warp of changes that have happened. But, you know, I think that there's been this kind of sort of consistent sort of like uh, notion that the social engagement was of value. And whether or not that was an immediate thing is always interesting to me when I'm talking to artists because there's a scale, right? And that scale of, oh, how did you approach this? And I think people talk about environment. They talk about audience. They talk about, there's lots of different terms that can come in. And, you mean um, the social engagement thing of um, breaking down the stage and being So in yeah, I mean, this real is a space. thing throughout the history okay. of the avant-garde was right. uh, to repair the social bond right. was one big way it was talked about uh, because uh, the, the scientific society we lived in uh, atomized us as communities. So we were no longer sort of living in that space of uh, immediate community, we were disillusioned. Uh, and I think that that's a curious thing that informed uh, art because the avant-garde was the only one to sort of push back throughout history against art itself. Right, it, it said these other forms of art are no, they're not sufficient to the needs of humanity in this era anymore. So we're sort of looking at that history, and that's what sort of informed a lot of these subsequent. You know, you talk about cubism, you talk about all these other art movements throughout history. They're all part of the avant garde, and that is they're using they're instrumentalizing these notions about art to look at what can be done to repair society in a sense. So that's curious to me, and, and then we're talking about participation, we're talking about dematerialization. And, 
this history now then uh, telescopes to the immediate moment, 